Hi, I'm Dr. Matthew Norton, founder of People Plus Purpose, and your host on this episode of the Truth Behind Dentistry podcast. And today, I'm excited to be joined by business coach Darren Caverna. Darren has invested over 25 years in the dental world and is the president and owner of Bright Ideas and also Accelerate My Practice with an MBA in finance and marketing. He lives in Colorado, enjoys outdoor activities with his three boys, and loves helping people achieve their dreams. Welcome, Darren. Hey, don't forget my wife, or if she sees this, I'll be in trouble. <laughs> he lives with his wife and three boys. <laughs> Just got to start off with some fun. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. My wife would probably feel the same way. So I, I think Thank, thankfully mine doesn't usually watch any of my content, so she'd never know. But just in case, this would be the one time. Yeah, just in case. Yeah. My wife doesn't usually either, even though she's proud of everything that I do, but she doesn't necessarily uh opt to spend the time. So well, I mean I've been looking forward to this conversation. I enjoyed uh when we've met previously and chatted about some things. And I think you've got a lot to share. Obviously, anybody who's been in the dental world 25 years, anybody who can marry that with an MBA and the insights that can come from those things together. Um, been looking forward to this. So uh I, I wanted to ask you first, what in your experience, as you've gone through all of these years in different roles uh, from your time with Patterson early on and all the way through the coaching work that you're doing now, uh, why do you think that some doctors do really well and others tend to struggle so much, even throughout their entire career? You know, it's it's a great question and it's a timely one, I think, in America in general. And I think part of the challenge there is, is I don't know that everybody holds the bar as high. I think you get some doctors who really hold the bar high. They do exceptional dentistry. Um, you, and you get some that don't do CE, uh, you know, other than the minimum requirements. And I think that that's a good predictor of who's going to succeed and why, because those who are doing a lot of CE, trying to constantly better themselves, if they are also holding their team to a higher level of, of productivity and performance and, and just holding them to a higher bar, they're going to see a different level of performance than others that don't. And the others that don't, I don't think it's that they don't want to. It's I, don't, I think it's fear. I think fear drives so much behavior in a negative fashion for, for doctors, that it's crazy. And in the last year or two, as the employment market has been rocky for lots of businesses and dentistry included, there's so many doctors that I run into who are afraid of their employees mm -hmm. and not afraid that they're going to come in and shoot the place up, mm -hmm. but afraid that their employees are going to quit and go somewhere else if they hold them accountable to perform at a higher level. And therefore the performance drops and frustration sets in and, and mediocrity becomes more the norm. And obviously I'm not speaking about every single practice because you get the range that it's terrible, the, the ones that are amazing and, and a whole lot in between. And anyone listening to this can sit there and ask themselves, well, do I hold my people accountable? Do I, do I push them to strive to be better? And the irony behind this is I find so many employees that I get to know in practices they want to do a good job. They really do. There are clearly some that are lazy, but I don't think that's the vast majority. I think the vast majority want to do a good job. They just don't necessarily know what they need to do to do a better job. Mm -hmm. And without the leadership, the doctor leading them and showing them and helping them and the fulfillment in the job drops. And when the fulfillment in the job drops for the average employee, the performance drops even worse. And now you have a toxic environment. And sadly, the worst thing that can happen is those people stay at your business for the next 10 years. <laughs> right. So th that's where I see well, at least one big area of opportunity for practices is, man, understand that truly deep down, I'd be willing to bet the vast majority of your people really do want to do well. They do take pride in their work. They want to do a great job. They just might not know how to. And I see a lot of doctors that 
extrapolate that their thought process matches and is the same for their employees, not realizing that their employees do not think like them. And it's not that they wouldn't want to if they could. It's just they're not wired the same. If they were wired the same, they would have gone to dental school as well. Right. So you have this disparity of, I assume you think just like me and you don't. And it's not that you don't want to, it's just, you don't know how to, if that so makes sense. The, so, yeah, for, so that's great. So for everybody listening who recognizes something in that, where they say, hmm, that might be at least a little bit true at my practice, what do you see as kind of a foundational starting point or to, to look at, to address to begin to turn some of this around, to be able to maybe shed a little light on kind of where they may be falling short in this area. Well, I'm going to go a slightly different angle because I want to make sure that people find something that will drive revenue in their practice. And I think it'll, it'll end up doing what you want. So it's going to be more of a long, a, a bit of a lengthy metaphor. One of the challenges I see in practices all over the country, man, I've been getting so many phone calls about this here lately, especially, and, and I'll use, and I'm going to pick on the PPOs. The challenge is that so many doctors feel like their practice can't be successful if they accept PPOs. And sadly, there's a bunch of people in my space who are espousing and teaching that and saying, you got to get out of every single PPO or else you're never going to make a good living. And while there certainly is some truth in those statements, because if you're writing off 20 or 30% or, or more, depending on where you're at and what your PPL reimbursement looks like, you could be hamstrung. But just automatically dumping all the PPOs is a recipe for a mess. And here's why I say that. I had a client in rural Iowa. I mean, in the middle of a cornfield, small town, only doctor, nothing even close. And in his case, 80% of his patient base had zero insurance, cash only. 20% of his patient base had insurance. When I typically tell that story to doctors, they're like, man, I would love to have that. And I, and I look at them sheepishly or in a jovial sort of way and go, let me understand something. Your case acceptance rate is below 50%. When you have the subsidization of insurance, when 50 to 80% of the patient's bill is going to be covered by a third-party payer and you still have an acceptance rate that's below 50%, how hard do you think it is to get somebody to say yes to treatment when they have to pull cash right. out? Right. So there's this disparity. There's this fear that, you know, I can't make it with insurance. I can't make it without it. I'm stuck what you can see is where we start to lower the bars, right? Mm -hmm. So here's where I see a solution. I just had this conversation with a doctor in Ohio last week. She was saying, hey, I'm, I'm busy, but I'm not necessarily making the living that I feel like I should be making. And, and she goes, PPOs are killing me, right? The exact same conversation. And I said, well, there's a few ways you can solve that. One is you can go out of network. And you're probably, as I say that, cringing, going, yeah, that sounds amazing, except it's not realistic because I'll lose 80% of my practice mm -hmm. because I'll go down the street to somewhere else. I said, of course, another solution is you can try and negotiate the fees, except there's 1,500 uh, 1, other dentists within a 10-mile radius of your office. So your ability to negotiate much with Delta, if you will, is not very good mm -hmm. because they'll just look at you and go, yeah, okay. Drop us then. I said, or here's scenario three. I said, if I assume for the sake of illustration that I as a patient walk in your practice and I need three units of something, crown and bridge, let's say, the average patient will look at you and go, ooh, can we do this one this year? And then let's wait until next year when my insurance renews and then we'll do this one. And who knows when we get to the third, right? Right. Super common scenario. So I said, now let me ask you something. If that patient said yes to all three of those and did those all in one sitting, does it take three times as long? She goes, no, about a, you know, one and a half times. I said, but it does generate you three times the fee. 
So the challenge becomes, and how you can be really productive in a PPO world, is how can you get patients to say yes to health? Not to one tooth, to health. Mm -hmm. And I like, to, I like to poke doctors and say, hey, you know, I believe in full mouth makeovers. And I like to say that because there's a somewhat of a negative stigma in, in dentistry in some circles anyway, because there were some continuing education programs in the years past who maybe overdid it. <laughs> so there's a negative stigma when I say that, that I say on purpose, because I want to say, I want to define it then next. And I want to define what a full mouth makeover is to me. A full mouth makeover to me is getting you to your ideal health. So for you as an illustration, maybe you just need a cleaning and you have ideal health. Maybe for this person sitting over here, they need two fillings and a cleaning and they're back to ideal health. Maybe for this person over here, they need like literally their whole mouth redone. So ideal health varies on the patient, but I'm a firm believer if we get the patients back to ideal health, health first, not finances first, coming from an MBA. But if we get them back to ideal health, the economics take care of themselves. Now, the challenge still remains as people are listening to this going, yeah, sure, Darren, that's awesome. Except when the insurance is maxed out, the patients don't like to do the treatment. And I had a doctor once in South Texas, El Paso to be specific. He's like, Darren, my patients only accept what's covered by insurance. That's the first thing that comes out of their mouths. And I happen to be in this guy's office. And I listened to him do an exam and I'm like, huh, this is interesting. So I then proceeded to record the next two exams. Would you like to guess who was the first one to bring up insurance? Um, I'm going to say it was the front office person. It was the doctor in the exam. Yeah, okay. They didn't even get to the front office to talk about insurance before the doc said, hey, we'll check and see if your insurance covers this. And I'm thinking to myself, again, psychology, lowering the bar, you're starting the bar low by bringing this topic up. And I'm not saying we should mislead patients by any means, because I don't endorse that. But why are we starting off with the number one objection? And let's just hand it right to them so it's easier for them to object. What if instead we just talked about their health and we let someone who's more qualified talk about economics, finances, and insurance? Someone who maybe doesn't have the fear of what the patient's going to say. Maybe someone who's more savvy in it. But of course, the challenge is who trained the front office? Maybe the doctor who has that same psychology set. So, you know, one of the, I like to jo jovially say that uh, you shouldn't cuss at your patients. And in my world, telling a patient they're maxed out is like telling a patient to F off. Because now what the patient thinks is, I can't get it. Right. I'm maxed out. Right. The reality is they're still getting, if they're a PPO patient, they're still going to get a 30% discount on your services. They just won't get the double coupon of the extra thousand dollars of reimbursement. So there's so many challenges here that I see, but the, the problem where it starts with the lowering of the bar is fear. Fear the patient's going to be mad at me. Fear the patient's going to go somewhere else. Fear the employee's going to go somewhere else versus standing up and being proud of what it is you do and understanding some people will say no, and that's okay. Because right now 50, I mean, I, I, Howard Fran and I sat down a number of years ago and we got into an interesting debate on case acceptance rates. And he's, according to Dentaltown and his research, the average acceptance rate in this country is 38%. So less than half of your patients are saying yes to your treatment right now, which is ironic because when I ask a doctor what their acceptance rate is, do you know what they tell me? They think it's higher than that for sure. Yeah. Oh, it's like 100%. Everybody everybody does what I say. Okay, let's see. I, the I haven't had anybody say 100, but. <laughs> but no, I haven't either. But high right. is usually high, the number. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Which isn't a number. Right. Right. <laughs> Right. So I just see the, the, the pressure of business ownership, the pressure of managing their debt, the pressure of trying to maintain right. a lifestyle has everybody just watering down the bar, lowering the bar such that so many doctors tend to struggle as a result. And, you know, it's interesting because I'm a numbers person, obviously, with, as an MBA. So I always start off with, hey, you know, what's your break even? 
And most doctors don't even know how to calculate it. They just think, go take my expenses from last year, divide by 12, that's my break even. I'm like, um, no, you're missing all your long-term liabilities. Those don't live on your PL. They live somewhere else. There's more math to do. But nonetheless, once we calculate your break even, then the challenge is the profit, the big profit is when you get above it. And the further above it you get, the more that that percentage is driven down. I had a client in Ohio once who said his overhead was like 80%, somewhere in there. I forget the number because it's been seven, eight years probably. And it's because he was just barely above his break even. And we grew his practice like four or $500,000. And at the end of the year, he's like, holy cow, my overhead's below 50% now. I'm like, yeah, because it's just a percentage of expenses. And as that revenue number gets bigger in the fixed expenses, which is the majority of them in a dental office, stay the same, your profitability goes way, way, way up. That's where freedom comes from. So, you know, thinking about the truth behind dentistry, there's so many fallacies that we we fall into. We fall into believing that the insurance company has more influence than us, and they definitely have a lot. We fall into the fallacy that once their insurance is maxed out, patients won't say yes to to their health. If they, if you were my oncologist, would I ask if my insurance was going to cover this? And I realize I'm being trivial in the sense that dentistry and cancer are different, of course. But you know, if you lose a tooth, you lose a tooth. It doesn't come back. So it's kind of the same-ish. Not life and death, maybe. But anyway, um, so the the truth is that you can be free of these problems you just have to be more influential. And where you have to start being influential is with yourself. When you're looking in the mirror, talking to yourself or driving to work, talking to yourself. And, and self, I mean, self-talk is amazing. I love looking at that. I had a, a client once who was telling me about some of the stories in her head. And I'm like, hey, can I ask you a question? She's sure. I, I said, if your best friend talked to you this way, would you still be friends with that person? She's like, Oh no, I had broke up with that friend a long time ago. I'm like, you need to break up with yourself because you're a terrible friend to yourself. Right. right. I think so, a lot, I think a lot of the a lot of the fear elements that you're talking about, I think that that's right. And I think people have a hard time standing and delivering on the courage of their convictions a lot of times because they've lost what their convictions actually were. To your point, I think about health being the focus, not not simply how we're going to navigate the financial elements of this and sometimes losing sight maybe of the of the how incredible this offering opportunity is that they have to provide for people how critically necessary it is and and they're not exuding like you said the first sale is themselves and they're not exuding uh they're not leading people to to the opportunity to say yes to the biggest to the biggest need they have to be fulfilled, right? So, so they do cave in at at various points, and 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 yes, the rest of the team follows suit in in thinking and playing smaller because it can even be bigger still, right? I mean, you can even go beyond what's in the mouth and say. Well, the, the oral health is connected to systemic health. And we can we can go even further and talk about the importance of the gut. I've done some interviews uh, here where it's like, no, we're taking this outside of beginning even in oral health and drawing connections. So that's just playing bigger, thinking bigger. And I think that's fear can be overcome if we've got a big enough driving why, right? And so I, I so I agree with every everything that you've said. Is there um is there anything else that you feel like um, would be a key factor in what's holding people back? Kind of before I want to ask you, before we end up wrapping up about kind of the future of, of private practice, but uh, as time's starting to get away, but what what else do you see holding people back in practice? You know, excuses, probably also driven by fear. I mean, really, I think fear is the number one driver of everything that goes wrong in lives. And, and you know the neurology probably better than I do of how the brain functions when you're in a feared state, right? The blood flow shifts from your prefrontal cortex to the amygdala. 
your ability to solve your way out of a brown paper bag just got small when you're triggered, which is a counseling or, or therapy term. Right. So, you know, how we can shift that out and change that blood flow to, to help people break free. And I think, as you said a moment ago, having a bigger why is one of the better reasons to do it. And, you know, I, I'll give you an illustration of that. I had a, a client in Idaho once that we were talking about this very topic. How do we treat the person? And, and we were using Invisalign as the illustration, actually, because they, they had some patient that had come in and she was a med student. And she had failed to get into to med school multiple times, and she felt it was her interview that was killing her. So this hygienist took it upon herself to offer her a better smile through Invisalign. And six months later, whatever the time frame was, she goes back in, she gets accepted to medical school. Now, I don't know what how the story ends because it was seven, eight years ago, and I've lost track of the obviously the patient for sure. But think about this scenario. What if, and I realize it's a what if game, but what if this person goes into research medicine instead of being an MD? What if as a result of this person going into research medicine, they are the one who discovers the cure to cancer? What if they, they develop some life-changing thing all because someone in a dental office cared enough to treat the whole person and solve a smile that was hindering a, a self-confidence that was hindering someone from getting into medical school. What if all of that could be true? And I don't know. I, I mean, I, obviously I'm painting a really big optimistic picture mm -hmm. for sake of illustration, but I know things like this do happen. And, and I know that people in dentistry do in fact save lives. Yes, absolutely. Literally save absolutely. lives. Yeah because they spend more time with patients than anyone else in dentistry. So I, I think the biggest challenge here is to really evaluate your why you do what you do as a team, as an owner, as a doctor, the whole group. And if your why is big enough, you'll have the courage to get through the hard times. I agree. Yeah, I agree. We need to think bigger, play bigger. And I really do like the thought of that we're changing the world that they're really, it, it is really world changing. And I think a lot of people who are bored in practice, a lot of people who are frustrated in practice, they're playing in too small a box, thus the insurance mindset tripping us up. It's because it's the game is too small from my perspective. Agreed. We gotta get, we gotta get outside of that. So I'm, I'm totally in agreement with what you're saying. Well, just to kind of shift a little bit, how maybe any of this impacts your thinking about the future of private practice or what, what else would you forecast looking ahead? What do you see being key elements maybe? You know, I, as I've watched it, it, and used the metaphor of uh, consumerism, you know, the Amazons and the Walmarts of the world, you know, they made a massive, massive run and the challenge is that I think the average person in the public has been become frustrated with that lack of service, that lack of caring in their shopping. And thus you're seeing the boutiques make a comeback, whether it's a little boutique that makes tumblers. I don't know how many of these I've run into lately or shirts or, or whatever the case might be. Right. I personally think that the the fear around corporate dentistry, I think the bubble's going to pop. I've been predicting it for a few years those in the corporate dentistry world don't like me predicting it, but you know, <laughs> so be it. I, I don't, I don't think it's the end of the world by any means. I, I personally think that the the bubble will pop because that no one enjoys that level of service or lack thereof, right? That's why corporate dentistry tends not to, they tend to want to suck every dollar of revenue out of a patient as quickly as they can because they know they will not be able to maintain a relationship with them because they've not figured out how to solve that problem. Ironically, it's the same people as that office down there doing the same stuff and yet they have not figured out how to create rapport such that right. patients stay. Yeah. So I believe you'll see a shift back the other way. I really do. I know there's a lot of people selling out and half the people I'm talking to, the reason why they're selling out is because they think the only way to compete is to lower their overhead by joining corporate. Right. Yeah. But man, when I've looked at the revenue of the corporate practices and I've looked at the P and L's, and especially when I look at, this is an interesting stat that 
seems to blow a lot of people away. When I look at revenue or net income per employee, it falls apart. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. In fact, the group practices with multiple doctors with the big teams, if you look at the revenue, the revenue per employee or net income per employee more impactfully, the number falls apart. The best ratio is a single doc practice that's a high performing practice that's doing $2 million or so in collections, which is realistic. Even if you're a PPO practice, you got to be smart. You don't have to work seven days a week. You can do that in four days a week because I've got lots of clients doing it. That's where I see the greatest profitability. So I think what's going to happen over time is people are going to start to decode this. The doctors are, so many of these doctors I meet are so much smarter than I'll ever be in my lifetime. It blows me away. And as soon as they put their head down and go, I'm going to solve this problem, they will solve this problem. There's zero dot in my mind because they're just too intelligent. But right now they're running around fearful, scared, thinking that selling or joining is the better way to go. And I think the title turn. Yeah. No, I agree with you because people want relationship. People want connection. They want to know their people, like their people, trust their people that are serving them. And that's kind of antithetical in many ways to that whole corporate exit approach, I think. So, and I and I think back to some of what you were saying earlier too, I think that stepping up into higher levels of leadership is another element of that to boldly move into greater leadership capacity, to be able to lead the team more effectively, more powerfully, uh, more inspirationally, and and to be able to lead and inspire patients. That's back to the case acceptance again for them to play at the highest level because you see it and are playing at the highest level in what you're offering. And also, I think just maybe with some of that comes a greater authenticity. People trust you more at that place than when you're trying to figure out how to jockey and finagle some of these other mid elements that are in the middle of this whole thing as a, you know, it's, I, it's like, I don't, I'm not inspired by that. Right. I don't want to follow that. I don't believe you a hundred percent. Yeah. The, the offices I run into trying to play games to make an additional dollar to me is a slippery slope that yeah. will probably end in stripes. And, and I, I don't want any part of it, won't have any part of it. And I'm pretty yeah. bold to look at doctors and go, this is just a terrible idea. There's a better way. Yeah. Well, you've got, I feel like we could talk for uh, another 20, 30 minutes. You've got a lot of great things to share for everybody who's been listening and is appreciating some of these insights that you are providing and would like to connect with you and hear more, learn more, see how you might be able to be provide some solutions for them. How do they best reach you? You know, probably the best way would be through my website. And I'll, I'll give you a more specific URL than just our, our homepage. Okay. Because um, it'll give them, there's a, a four minute video that sort of summarizes some of this. I guess they maybe they don't need to see the video if they just listen to this, but uh, acceleratemypractice.com, A-C-C-E-L-E-R-A-T-E, mypractice.com. And then if they want to go to that particular page, it's forward slash growth. Okay. And then there's a calendar link right there. They can schedule with me right through it all the time. Uh, works really well. It'll, if they sign up through there, they will get a bunch of my content free of charge for, man, I think I've got nine months programmed in there. And it's, it's literally the how to, it's the DIY version of my program in video slash emails that'll come to you. Um, so, I mean, if you're a do-it-yourselfer and you don't want to hire someone like me because I talk too fast, that's okay. You can <laughs> sign up there, get all the content, figure it out. And if you like what you're hearing, just do me a favor, give me a thumbs up and say, this is amazing and awesome and cool. I, I don't mind giving it away. I'll give it away all day long because I, I love the industry I'm in. I want to see it grow and do better. And so I'm happy to just contribute to it. And there, there will always be some percentage who are going to be like, hey, this is good stuff. I would like some more help and they'll call. So it's okay. Yeah, yeah perfect. Well, I, I think you've got a lot to offer. I'm trusting that people will reach out to you as a result of this. And um, I look forward to that, uh, you being able to help them. So appreciate your time. I appreciate your, your contribution today. We're in one accord on what some of these issues are and what some of the solutions are. So I appreciate you. Appreciate the work you're doing. Well, it's my pleasure to be your guest. I look, 
I, I'm grateful for it. And I'd be happy to do it another time if uh, people want us to dig into a different topic. Yeah. And a lot of people apparently appreciate higher speed, right? Because to the degree that you speak at a, at a high speed, then they don't have to hit the little control thing that turns it up to one and a quarter or something, right? Yeah. Maybe it doesn't need to be a setting that's 0.85. It's <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I, maybe anyway. I drink too much coffee. <laughs> No, it's all, all good. So I appreciate everybody for listening. This is Matthew Norton, uh, founder of People Plus Purpose, and I have been with Darren Caverna of Accelerate Your Practice and hope you've enjoyed our conversation today. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thank you.